Joyce, and uh, welcome everyone. Great, uh, great honour to have the opportunity to uh, address uh, the crowd at uh, China Place. Uh, it's a fabulous fair, and I'm sure you'll agree that uh, walking around, you, you've got to see some of the most amazing pieces of technology um, going around in the industry. So, yeah, the topic of my discussion is the future of plastics recycling technology. I'll probably preface it by saying that uh, it's, it's, this industry is, is so dynamic at the moment and growing because it is a very young industry. But it's almost like uh, something new gets invented on one side and it sends a ripple through the industry. I know you've got Kurt speaking later from Arima, who are at the forefront of that development. And uh, you know, someone described it to me the other day as it's like someone sits on a, on a waterbed and it sends a wave right through the industry. And that's what it's like because there's so many developments and new technology. So it's a very exciting time to be in recycling and, and it's a very exciting time for me to be in recycling. recycling. And this is the way we view it. It's generally an industry view and, uh, and uh, in the UK um, people are looking at closed loop recycling. Well, it happens to be the name of our firm, but actually it's a term, small c, small l recycling. And what it means is effectively taking, and it, and it actually, it's not just plastics, so you can, you can take the concept of closed loop and you can actually move it across uh, the spectrum because it can actually represent any material type. So the product's manufactured, we have a bottle, like this bottle here, consumer, like myself, knocks off the water and uh, and then uh, use the bottle. So use it for its key its key technical performance and it might be carbonation, but the key job is the preservation of the material that's inside. And then of course we put it into the uh, into the recycling stream, into the collection bins and uh, and do the right thing. And then it comes to a a company like mine where we reprocess the material and turn it back into a plastic that can go back into a bottle. So that's taking it all the way up the hierarchy and effectively reuse. So, so that's the key. So moving it from not just recycling, and we all know reduce, reuse, recycling. We all know that hierarchy. Closed loop recycling is about getting it as far up that hierarchy as we possibly can. So I thought, just set the scene. Why recycle? Why are we recycling? Obviously, it's a resource thing, and today's topic of carbon emissions is crucial. I mean, uh, our little plant in London uh, represents 52,500 tonnes of carbon emission savings. So you've got strong and growing demand for these key polymers, PET and HDPE, from brand owners wanting to shrink their carbon footprint. So you, you have two major drivers here. You've got nations that are trying to shrink their carbon footprint, consuming outside of what is their ideal state. As well, you've got consumers who are savvy and aware of it. And they're, they're driving the, the brand owners, the major brand owners and the major retailers, whether it be Tesco's, Morrison's, Asda, and all the equivalents all around the world, Carrefour's and the lot, to, to reduce their carbon footprint. And that's what recycling does. You use 50% recycled content in that bottle, and the carbon footprint of that bottle is reduced by 25%, which is a massive leap. When we're all running around trying to save twos and three and four percent in carbon footprint reductions, the use of recycled content is an enormous leap forward in, in carbon footprint reduction. So, um, an obvious one is virgin prices and supply pressures, and, and right now we're seeing it's a staggering time, really, because uh, we've seen a lot of a lot of contractual relationships have been forced into force majeure, and that is supply issues in relation to the oil are making it more and more difficult to receive uh, virgin polymers. And so many re many manufacturers in the United Kingdom have been you know attempting to get a lot more material, um, you know, just in recent times. And that's where recycling, you know, you displace virgin resin. As soon as you put that, this is how crucial it is, when you put that into the recycling bin, you're displacing virgin resin. <laughs> Customer demand. I mentioned the 50% the recycled content. And that's where a lot of the retailers and a lot of the brand owners want to go to. In the UK at the moment, every single milk bottle that's sold through the retail um, networks has 15% recycled content. 
So that was an industry initiative under what's called the Milk Roadmap. And so the whole industry have moved, first we went to 10%, and now we're pushing to 15%. Their goal is actually 50% recycled content of high density polyethylene by the year 2020. And all the tests that we've done, all the, all the lab work that has been done, shows that this is achievable, both from a technical point of view and also from a food safety point of view. So pots, tubs and trays currently uh, in the UK, many pots, tubs and trays contain 50% recycled content. And, uh, and the other thing that's interesting that's occurring is that you've got a major shift. You've got a shift of manufacturers from, from polymers like PVC and polystyrene into things such as PET and polyethylene, polypropylene. It really, poly, poly, PET, HDPE and polypropylene are you know, doing the job of most of the, of the packaging forms. And so we've had a recent one, a recent announcement in the UK where Rachel's Yogurt, you know, a fairly well-known brand in the United Kingdom, moved from the polystyrene uh, packaging form into, um, into a PET packaging form that contains 50% recycled content. So these are all the things that are pushing the industry and these are all the things that are, that are helping us develop new technologies. So, quick background on what we actually do in East London. So, beautiful Darshan Harm. I don't know if anyone's familiar with London, but, uh, but where we, our plant is located is, um, is out in the east, in Dagenham. And, uh, and Dagenham is an area that was completely destroyed during the war. And plants like mine are actually now starting to spring up. We looked at a number of different sites. We looked at a couple in Kent, one called in Crayford, another one called um, Badger's Chaff. And uh, but we ended up in, um, in beautiful Dagenham. So we've got a 52,500 feet facility. And, uh, and what we do is we bring in 35,000 tonnes of bottles. We put them through a dry cleaning process. We then optical sort them. So we send the HD one way and the PET the other way and we use near-infrared sorting, which I'll talk about in a moment in that area. And, um, and we, then we then plus, place them over a manual sort, still in bottle form, and then down into the granulators where we chop them up into 12 millimeter flakes. We put them through a hot wash, about 85 degrees Celsius with a bit of surfactant, a bit of caustic soda. We put them through a purification process, which is the key. And I won't preempt Kurt because his process is one of the leaders in this area. In fact, we, we actually use uh, the Arima technology in our plant in Dagenham for high density polyethylene and, uh, and another one, a different one for PET. And then ultimately, of course, the key, the key sign off is the quality assurance. And that, that is a rigorous testing regime um, that, it, that has been specifically developed to ensure that you have achieved food grade status. So, sorting technology right now. Where are we at right now? Well, we opened our plant in Dagenham two and a half years ago. And I can honestly say that a lot of the material, a lot of the, the equipment in there is out of date. We've had to continually upgrade. You know, whether it be software changes, um, machinery changes. In fact, you know, one of the exciting things here I'm, I'm looking at is, is things such as pre-wash preparing the material in a better form. So where are we now? I'd say right now we're, we're at a, a state of great change, but we do have access to incredible equipment. Near-infrared sorting equipment, which is commonplace in material recovery facilities, and of course in, in, uh, in plastics plants such as mine. Manual sorting, obviously, that's the very basis, basic one, but uh, we, we would have on every shift probably six to eight manual sorters. Then, then we use things such as elutriation, which is basically using fluids and particle size to be able to separate. And that is a developing science in itself. You would think it's so basic. You know, sink float technology, ensuring that it's, it's nothing more than a giant swimming pool, putting the polymers in, and, uh, and, but, but even that is changing. Uh, equipment's becoming smaller, it's becoming more efficient. If you get that wrong, you're in a lot of trouble and your customers are never very happy with you. So density separation, very similar thing, removing the caps via flotation. Then we have things such as flake sorters. And one of the pieces of equipment that I would say that we're very proud of in our facility is um, the first generation of laser sorters using laser Raman uh, spectroscopy. 
it's not an easy word to say. Um, but uh, using that technology where it actually fingerprints the material and, and identifies it and on a yes, no basis. So if you're a good PET flake, you stay in. If you're a bad PET flake, you're out. If you're not a PET flake, you're out. So things such as silicon or silicone, um, coloured flakes, PVC, they're all critical items that need to be separated out. And that's part of today's technology. Part of, part of today's technology, but an ever-changing one. Metal detection. And I saw a numerous um, exhibitors this morning. Um, you know, some of the leaders, I probably don't want to mention too many names, but we, we do use, we use S plus X technology widely in our plant um, for metal detection. And, uh, you know, even that is taking leaps and bounds into, into new areas. So, now, what's next? Very interesting. <coughs> Near infrared, not just bottle sort, but flake sort. So using near-infrared technology, and, and there's one of the major manufacturers has developed a machine that we're trialling currently in our plant at Dagenham. It's a much cheaper technology than, than laser, and, uh, but it has the potential to be very, very exciting. So you, you will have the ability financially to be able to send the material through a number of different processes that use near-infrared technology that purifies the stream. And ultimately, that's what we're all about. We're all trying to get a pure stream a pure material stream. Conveyor-fed laser roaming systems I touched on. You know, uh, the, um, the latest in technology in that area, uh, Unisensor power sort, it's, it's outstanding equipment and, uh, and we're seeing, I mean, it is, it is very expensive equipment, but if you're serious about the business and you want to move to the next stage, these are all the sorts of equipments that you've got to look at. Then the other interesting one that we're, we're also very excited about is machine vision systems. Systems that you can, you can actually teach the machine to look at the shape of a bottle. And, uh, and so trigger packs, which are always challenging because they've got all sorts of you know, metals in them tucked away and, and other polymers. Um, if you can use the machine to actually identify it by shape, then that is a great step forward. The final one I've got on this page is a project that we're working on with the European Commission um, support, and it is actually putting a marker into the polymer. And it's absolutely fascinating because when you start to get to, um, when you start to get to sort out different polymers that have very similar footprint or fingerprint using NIR, so they look the same. So the machine might look at it and say, I think you're a PVC bottle, but I'm not certain, right? Because they, they send back a very similar way. Um, this, this technology allows us to put a marker in it. New technology, new, new products such as PLA, they're not, they're not compatible with our recycling stream, with our PET recycling stream. So we're looking at projects where we actually put a marker in it so we can identify it and we can safely take it out and we can ensure that we end up with a nice, clean stream. So, so they're just a couple of technologies that are, that are in, in the works. And, uh, and, you know, you don't have to walk very far from this room to actually see some of the early stages of that work. About 6,000 tonnes of that material a year. And I've got to say, it's so robust. It's a, very, it's a very robust system. It relies very heavily on getting the right material into the, into the, um, into the machine. But it, it is very robust. Once you get that right, once you get over those hurdles, you, uh, you actually get... And, and, now, recently, we're seeing work on polypropylene. So, early stage work on polypropylene. Um, I, I, I said, we were talking about this last night, actually, and I was saying that, that there are literally boffins working in labs around the world that are working on this type of technology, taking polypropylene, which is a fantastic form, a fantastic polymer for food packaging, and restoring it back to food grade. Before I put this one in, that's a, I'm talking about a specific and what it does is, it takes flake and it, it melts an unusual bit, puts it through a filter screen, and then straight into the cavities where it creates its machine. Because you're saving one complete heat life for a polymer. And what does that mean? To put it in simple terms, it means you end up with a clearer bottle. And, uh, and, and the work we've done with these guys has been very, very exciting. And this machine has actually been purchased by one major um, manufacturer, packaging manufacturer, and we expect, and so we, we've cut up bottles 
and we've uh, we've cut up bottles, we've looked at the uh, the layers, and we've tested them for their compatibility with recycling. Can we take out the bad bits? Can we leave in the good bits? But it is it's a move that's coming um, more and more. Caps and labels they're crucial. Using glues that melt at a say lower than 85 degrees Celsius, they should be a given, but they're not always a given. In fact, the dairy industry we've had to drag kicking and screaming from their very intense glues to something that's a little bit more workable when it comes to a recycler. So, you know, we're, we're very good whinges recyclers. We're very good at stating our case, um, which is, you know, often comes across the, the wrong way. But, uh, but the fact is, we just want to make sure that we produce a good product so that it can go back into a bottle at some stage. The development of something that's very interesting and everyone can access, you'll see that little web, web uh, URL down the bottom there. PetBottlePlatform.eu. This is a website that is dedicated to showing manufacturers of packaging what are the do's and don'ts, what are the things that are important to us, and the things that are, you know, that they can we can just live with. And so we have a green light, we have an amber light, and we have a red light. And uh, and if you go to the pet bottle platform, you'll see. That, um, that uh, the sort of things that the damage recycling and the sort of things that are very positive for recycling. Okay, just to finish off, um, I'm just, I, I want to mention this for one moment. The next phase, which is mixed plastics, so we've all been collecting bottles for many years, and what we're seeing now are non bottles being collected. Out of the 350 councils in the United Kingdom, over 80 are collecting non bottle plastics. And so we're seeing the development of what we call PERFs. Plastics recovery facilities, and uh, and these perfs are going to have the ability to take in all forms of packaging types in plastic, separate them out effectively by polymer, not just bottle, using shape and other polymer type, and then being able to effectively recycle it. We've got three acres, as you can see, right next to our uh, existing facility in in uh, Dagenham, and we're going to put in there. It won't be the UK's first perf. I think it'll be the UK's third perf. But it is something that is absolutely top priority for most recyclers around the world because it's all about the sorting and then, it, and then getting it into the technology in the right form. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention.